So in this lesson, we're going to talk about networking media. So we're basically talking about different cable types that we reference inside of our networking uh, domain. The first one we're going to talk about is kind of older. It's uh, called coaxial cable, also known as coax. And you're probably familiar with this from your cable TV service. <laughs> uh, coaxial cable, known as coax for short, is composed of two conductors. You have an inner conductor. You can see here the gold inner conductor, where, it is, where the data is passed. And this is called the center wire. And it's insulated around by this white uh, shielding. And then the outside has this braided metal shield that helps protect the data as well. The nice thing about coax is it's very resistant to EMI because of this metallic sh uh, shielding. Uh, so it actually allows data to be transferred further. When we talk about EMI, we're talking about electromagnetic interference. So if we run a cable over a fluorescent light, for instance, the fluorescent light gives off EMI that can jarble the communications on the network cables. With a uh, coaxial cable, because of that metal shielding, it keeps that, that garbledness out of the cable. Uh, we talk about some other cables like uh, RJ45, excuse me, um, yeah, RJ45 Ethernet cables. Uh, they tend to be a little more susceptible to EMI. There are three types of coax cables out there, um, and they're defined basically by the thickness of the cable and the connector on the end. Uh, the three types that we're going to talk about are RG6, RG58, and RG59. So RG6 is commonly used by your local cable company to connect the individual homes. This is a line that runs into your house from the service provider. Uh, RG58 is a type of coax that was popular in our early 10 base 2 Ethernet networks. So uh, if you see 10 base 2, think old networks, um, very slow, it only ran 10 megabits per second. And the base 2 meant that it could go about 200 meters, is 185 meters. Uh, RG59 was typically used to carry component video between nearby devices. This is the kind that you have going from your cable box to your TV. Okay? And you'll notice that that's a thinner cable than some of these other ones. The connector types on, uh, on coaxial cables, there's two different types. We have what's called the BNC connector or the F-type connector. The BNC is also known as the Bayant Neelman Concealment Connector or the British Naval Connector. This is what was used in our old Ethernet 10 base 2 networks. For your cable TV, you actually use an F-type connector, which is that screw-on connector to the back of your TV. With these uh, BNC connectors, they were actually a push and twist. It was only like a half a twist would lock it in place. Uh, with the F-type, you have to actually screw it on. Uh, in our networks nowadays, the place you're going to find coax is generally in your cable modems coming into the house to your cable modem. Once it gets to the cable modem, it'll switch it into a twisted pair of cable, which is what we use for most of our networking nowadays. Um, this is the most popular type of physical media that we use on our networks. Each cable on the inside has eight strands of wire, and each of these strands are actually set in pairs that are twisted around each other, which is why we call it twisted pair of cable. Um, the tighter the twist, the less electromagnetic interference that we're going to experience. So if you have a higher quality cable, like a CAT6 or a CAT7 cable, they have more twist per inch than does a CAT5, which is an older style cable. There's two types that we talk about. We have unshielded twisted pair and shielded twisted pair. The twisting is the same. The difference is the, the rubber uh, plastic cable on the outside. The shielding has a metal uh, foil wrap inside of that. The unshielded does not. And I'll show you a picture of that here in a second. So if you take one of these twisted pair cables apart, you'll see why they call it twisted pair. You have these eight wires that are color coded and twisted in pairs and then twisted around themselves to eliminate more of that EMI. Uh, the shielded twisted pair has a metal shield around these wires between them and the rubber jacket. The unshielded does not. These wires are twisted in pairs and surrounded by the metal shielding that prevents EMI. And the outer shielding uh, minimizes our EMI but it does add to the cost. So shielded twisted pair costs more, and they're a little harder to work with because they're they don't bend as well. The unshielded twisted pair is what we use in most places. Um, it has the same number of twists, and it actually has more. The, the more twists gives you less EMI. Each wire then insulates each other by doing this twisting that helps minimize our EMI. And UTP is cheaper than STP, uh, the unshielded twisted pair, because you don't have to pay for that metal foil on the inside. And in most networks, this is what you're going to be using, is unshielded twisted pair, as you can see here. These are the cable specifications for our unshielded twisted pair. Um, notice the category 3 was 10 megabits per second, which is the same speed as our old Ethernet networks uh, with 10 base 2. 
Cat5 went up to 100 megabits per second, and now we're using Cat5e and Cat6 in most networks, which is 1,000 megabits per second, or one gigabit per second. What that, we also refer to that as gigabit ethernet, or gig E. Once you get into 6a and 7, uh, you're starting to deal with 10 gigabits per second. The cost is pretty prohibitive on those still right now, so most people when they're installing networks are using 5e and 6, because again, one gigabit is a very fast speed, and the price is, is a good price point. Uh, notice the maximum distance in this table is all 100 meters. So these cables can only go 100 meters, and at that point, the electrical signal starts decreasing to the point where it's not usable. So if you need to go more than 100 meters in a building, you have to hit some active component to boost that signal back up, whether that's an old style active hub or a switch. Okay? So if you go, so when you're designing a building, if you have a 200 meter building, you need to put your switch at the 100 meter point right in the middle. That way you can reach both ends of the building, right? Because if you started at one end and went 200, it wouldn't go that far. You'd have to have another switch. So switch placement becomes important as you're designing your building. So the connector types for this, um, there's three different ways that we connect them. The most popular and the one that we use all the time is the RJ45. RJ45 is what looks like a fat phone jack. It has all eight pins from that cable being used and it's used for ethernet networks. Now even though there's eight pins that are wired to it, only four of them are actually used inside that cable. The other four are being reserved for future use and we haven't needed them yet. Um, RJ11 is a six pin connector. Um, but usually only two or four of those pins are used. That's your standard telephone line. It's just like a regular phone jack on the old analog phone systems. Uh, the cabling, the unshielded twisted pair is the same type of cabling you would use for a phone, phone jack. The only difference is which connector you're putting on the end, whether you're putting the eight pin connector on or that two or four pin connector for RJ11. And then the last one is a DB9 cable, RS232, uh, which is a nine pin D sub-miniature connector this is our serial port connector. And remember we talked about when we dealt with, um, excuse me, when we were dealing with uh, the rollover cables from Cisco, we would have one end would have an RJ45 and the other end had a, a, a serial connector, a DB9. Um, this is used for synchronous, uh, asynchronous serial communications for connecting external modems uh, or using something like a rollover cable to configure a switch. So we have different uh, types of cables in the shielded twisted pair and unshielded twisted pair as well. We have what's called a straight through or a patch cable and the reason why it's called a straight through is both pins on both sides of the cable are the same. So pin 1 goes to pin 1, pin 2 goes to pin 2, etc. through pin 8. Um, this is used to connect a computer to a switch. So when you're taking your computer to the switch back here it's using a straight through cable. If I wanted to connect two computers together directly like in a peer-to-peer -peer network I would have to actually switch my transmit and receive pins inside those eight pairs. And they do that using what's called a crossover cable because you crossed over the transmit and receives. This uh, allows that swapping to happen and you can connect a uh, computer to a computer in that fa fashion without needing a switch in between them. So when we build these materials for these uh, cables, we have two types. We have what's called plenum and non-plenum. And this is a really important thing to understand for the a exam. So plenum means that it is a special cable. The plastic and the materials that are used in it have fire retardant in them. So if they start burning, it's going to minimize the dangerous fumes that are going to catch on fire or that are going to be released when the cable is on fire. If you're going to put a cable inside a wall, a ceiling, or a raised floor, essentially if you can't physically see the cable, you have to use plenum by electrical codes. Okay? If you're going to have a cable that's just run across your desktop, you can use non-plenum. And non-plenum are just normal rated uh, shielded or unshielded twisted pair cable, but they cannot be used in a place that you can't see. Okay? So if you go to the store to go buy some cable, you can buy a thousand feet of cable in a spool. If you buy non-plenum, it might be, say, $40 for a thousand feet of Cat 5e. If you go buy plenum, it may cost you $150. It's a lot more expensive, but it can be used by code in those places where you can't see it. So if you're going to run a bunch of network cables in your house and you're putting it through the walls or through the ceiling, you want to get plenum because if it starts burning, those non-plenum ones will give off noxious gases that can actually kill people in your house, right, or in your small business. So it's very important to have the right one and use plenum anytime you're doing it in a place you can't see, non-plenum if you can see it. The next one we're going to talk about is fiber optic cables, okay. Um, this is kind of the future. Uh, they're very, very fast. 
and they're very, very good, uh, but they're very expensive as well. Uh, they work by transmitting light from an LED or a laser to send information over this long glass fiber. Okay? Um, because they're using light and not electricity to transfer the information, there is no EMI that's going to make it have a problem. Because EMI is electricity that, that interferes. It's not going to interfere with our light signals. The benefits of fiber optic is we can get very long distances, up to many, many miles. And they also have a greater data carrying capacity. So when we were talking about Cat5e, we talked about it was one gigabit per second, right? Here we're talking about things that can go up into the terabytes per second. Okay? These things can go extremely fast. Uh, there's two types. There's multi-mode and single mode. And we're going to talk more about those right now. So multi-mode is a thicker inside uh, core. This glass core is thicker. Uh, but when I say thicker, it's still very thin. It's only 62.5 microns wide. So it's very, very small, uh, a little bit bigger than a human hair. Uh, and so what ends up happening is you actually can use these to connect your routers to switches, switches to switches, or servers to switches. And with multi-mode, it's going to give you less distance than single mode because it allows multiple ways for the light to travel. So when it's traveling through this cable, it can bounce inside the cable a little bit and get there at different times. So it's not as good for distance, but it does still give you those high speeds. When you deal with single mode, the core size goes down to only 10 microns. So instead of being 62 and a half, we're down to 10. And because it's so small, all the, the light travels in one direction only and gets there from one end to the other. It handles longer distances better, though. So if I'm going to do something that's going to connect, say, DC to Baltimore, which is, what, 30 or 40 miles, I can use a single mode fiber to do that. Um, it also gives you very high speeds as well, um, and it allows that single mode to travel down the core of the fiber. The way we connect these is one of four ways. We can use the SC, which is the subscriber connector in the top left. We also refer to this lovingly as the stick and click, because when you push it in, you'll hear a little click noise. Okay? Um, the ST is the straight tip connector, is what it stands for. Uh, my folks like to call these lovingly the stick and twist because to put them on, you push it in and then twist half a turn to the right and it locks it in place, much like a BNC connector. Uh, the Lucent connector is named for the company that developed it, Lucent Technologies. Um, and as you can see, you have the single cable with, uh, excuse me, you have the uh, square tips uh, and two cables going into the, the, uh, the single port there. And then the MTRJ is the Mechanical Transfer Register Jack, usually used for switches and um, excuse me, switches and routers. It has a much smaller connector size than others. Uh, the ones you're going to see on the back of your computer is usually going to be the SC or the ST. Uh, the ones on the switch will usually be the MTRJ. Um, the one thing to note with fiber, notice how these are done in pairs. That's one for transmit, one for receive. You can't transmit and receive over the same single fiber. You have to have one for each. Okay, so like the ST there, the blue, uh, excuse me, the black might be send and the red might be receive. Now the cable doesn't care which one is which, they just color code that for you as the technician to know what you're using. So you'll come up with the, with the standard at your place of what you use, um, but that, that's the reason why we do that. So if you're comparing fiber and copper, uh, you have to look at the advantages and disadvantages of them, right? Fiber, much higher bandwidth than copper, right? Can go much longer distances than copper and it's immune to EMI and it gives you better security because you can't get the data off the copper uh, off the fiber without actually breaking into that line. With copper, the big advantages there are that they're cheaper. Okay? It's much cheaper and much easier to work with and much easier to install and the tools are inexpensive. If you want to make your own cables for copper cables with a twisted pair and unshielded <coughs> twisted pair, you can buy a kit on Amazon for $10 that'll give you the crimpers some ends, some strippers, and a tester, right? If you want to get some stuff to do fiber optic stuff, it's about $200 for a cheap kit. So much, much more expensive for the tools and much more difficult to work with. Most businesses you're going to run into are still using uh, unshielded twisted pair because of the cost and the efficiency. It does do relatively high speeds, one gigabit or more, um, and it's very cheap. So if you have uh, a building that comes with fiber and you need it to be converted to Ethernet, or you have Ethernet and need to convert it to fiber, you can use a media converter. And here's a stack that just gives you an example of what some of them look like. 
You can see on the top here we have an SC connector for fiber, and it comes out as Ethernet RJ45. The second one in the stack has ST connectors, those stick and twist, and they come out as RJ45 as well. So we can convert fiber to Ethernet, Ethernet to fiber. They even have ones that go coaxial to fiber or fiber to coaxial or coaxial to Ethernet and Ethernet to coaxial. All a media converter does is transmits one type of signal to another type. So we take in a light signal over fiber and convert it to an electrical signal over Ethernet. Why would we use this? Because maybe we needed to go long distances so we were going to run a fiber between our two buildings because we had to go a mile away. And Ethernet wouldn't do that. But both of our devices on the other ends were both Ethernet devices. So we would put a media converter on either side. Um, these devices aren't that expensive, usually about $40 or $50. Okay? But again, you're going to need one on each side to convert back, right? So if you have something like an RG59, what type of cable are we dealing with? Is that a plenum cable, a fiber optic cable, a twisted pair cable, or a coaxial cable? D, right? It's coaxial. So one of the tricks that you can remember for this is anytime you see RG in A+, we're talking coaxial. So RG6, RG58, RG59 are all coaxial cables. If you're dealing with RJ, RJ is for twisted pair. So it's either RJ11 for phones, RJ45 for Ethernet. Okay? So keep that in mind. 